you know, you're, the, you're supposed to control the weather. <laughs> we don't fly bad weather, but we, we could see the weather over here. And I looked out the window and that tornado came down just like this, down toward the ground. And Ken said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You get back up there. And that tornado went, woo, 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 woo. Did you notice how she says that she and her husband, Kenneth, they can control the weather, but they don't fly in bad weather? <laughs> if it is true that Gloria Copeland can control the weather by the words that she speaks, and by the way, it's not just Gloria Copeland. Many of the faith preachers claim to be able to do this. Jesse Duplantis, I mean, they, many of them do. Every year, thousands of people are killed in weather disasters, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods that cause mudslides, wildfires. Where are they? They can't do what they say they can do. They're liars. These people are not Christian. As these programs are airing, I am speaking something into existence. They teach that we can do the exact same things that God can do. We can speak things into existence, create our own realities with the words that we speak, with the words of our faith. Dear friends, only God can speak things into existence. That is not an ability that you and I have. You know, of course I believe in, in Christ as the Savior and all, but, you know, I, th I think too, Glenn, I've spent a lot of time in India, you know, I've been with a lot of Hindu people. They're nice, kind, you know, people that love God as well, so. No, Hindus do not love God because they do not know God. How can you love someone who you don't even know? And dear friends, Joel Osteen is doing no one any favors by telling the world that Hindus love God especially not the Hindus. He continues to deny that Jesus is the only way to be saved. And so Joel Osteen is a false teacher. He is a false prophet. See, Jesus was man until God touched him and put the spirit of the living God on the inside of him. And that's encouraging today. No, that's heretical today. That's heresy. Jesus was just a man until God touched him, put his spirit on the inside of him. That's heresy. And if you've never prayed in tongues, if you follow Lord, my instructions, the anointing is here to do the rest. I can't do it for you, but I can tell you how to pray in supernatural languages. <laughs> I know you don't know what to say. Make real nonsense syllables up. They're not nonsense. But they're the first words coming out of your spirit. Do it faster. I said faster. I said faster. You can do it faster than that. If I had a gun in your room to do it faster. If this is something for which the Holy Spirit gives us utterance, why in the world would it ever be necessary to teach people how to do it? And then I began to look up through the gate, and I could see this kind of pinnacle in the middle of the city. It's kind of a hill high and lifted up. There's a river flowing down the side of this, well, it's the river of life, and it's coming down the side of this mountain or hill, if you will, and at the top of that is the brightest light I've ever seen. And I know who that is. It's the Lord high and lifted up. This is his city. The title of your book is 90 Minutes in Heaven, and you can't remember whether or not you saw God? 3 John 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you might prosper in every way and that your body might keep well, even as I know your soul prospers and keeps well. So we see right there that God wants us to be healthy. Can everybody say, God wants me to be healthy? This is not a theological statement. This is not a doctrinal statement. It's not a statement of teaching. It's not a didactic, not a teaching statement. It's simply a common greeting to a letter. Nothing more and nothing less. And the faith preachers know it, but they don't want you to know it because it just happens to fit their theology. Jesus placed your and my sickness and diseases, infirmities, 
upon Jesus and He bore them 2,000 years ago. If He already paid for your healing, how can you doubt that you are healed? Andrew Womack just taught that healing is provided for in the atonement and he of course appeals to Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. And so let's look at the context of the passage. It becomes very clear to us when we read the very next verse. Very clearly, the primary context of Isaiah 53 is not physical healing, it's spiritual healing. Not healing from sickness and disease, healing from sin. We see that from these two words, transgressions and iniquities. Yet how many times have we heard Benny Hinn or Andrew Womack or one of these prosperity preachers say, by his stripes we are healed, so you ought to be physically healed. I'm going to stand up in faith and I'm going to sow an Isaiah 54, 17 seed of $54.17. Let's go to the phone. Do it right now. Go to the phone. When this was written, there was no chapter 54, verse 17. And yet you see prosperity preachers do this all the time based on Isaiah 54, 17 or some other verse that they like that, that happens to fit their theology. And they are counting on their followers and their listeners being biblically illiterate so that they can fall for their schemes. These people are charlatans. Do I believe that God wants to bless us? Yes. But when you go to the conferences, you ask people to give money. So yeah. You say, do it cheerfully. Yeah. Because the Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. See, giving is a major part of the whole Christian doctrine. But do you believe that if someone gives money to the ministry, right. that more will come back to them? Yes. Absolutely. I think that's what they mean by prosperity gospel. Yes. No, but you worry at all that, that sometimes your message will be heard by someone in the most dire circumstances. It's a sort of roulette wheel, a sort of gamble with God. Okay, well, I can't pay the rent, but I'll give it to Joyce and we'll see what happens. Do you worry at all that well, that I, happens? I totally know. I don't worry about that. Joyce Meyer says, I, no, to I totally don't worry about that. Well, I'm sure she doesn't, but she should. Because right now, even as we speak, there are thousands of people all around the world who are watching TBN and Daystar and Lasea Broadcasting and the Word Network and all these things. And they are hearing this endless drivel of saying, you send us your money and God will give you a harvest. And there are people at home, they are poor, they are sick, they are desperate, they have sick children. And so in desperation, they get out their checkbook or they get out their credit card and they send in money to these multi-millionaire preachers who fly in private jets and who live in multi-million dollar homes. Jesse Duplantis, for example, lives in a 35,000 square foot parsonage. But when your wealth is gained off of preying upon the hopes and fears of hurting and sick and desperate people, there's a lot wrong with that. When your wealth is gained off of distorting the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's a lot wrong with that. Principle four, you determine the size of your harvest when you sow your seed. Do you need a big harvest? Then you sow lots of seed. Do you need a big harvest? Then you sow lots of seed. So if you have cancer, or if you have a sick and dying child, you had best dig deeply. Because the bigger miracle you need, the bigger monetary seed you'd better sow. Dear friends, sowing and reaping is a biblical concept. It is. But more often than not, when the Bible talks about sowing seed, the seed to which it refers is itself. So if you want to sow some seed, by all means, I heartily encourage you to do so. Sow this seed into the lives of people and watch God bring a harvest. Okay, when, when God restored the truth of healing, the devil put a signpost that said heresy. Yeah. When, when God restored the truth of prosperity, the devil put a signpost that says heresy. Yeah. And the church back off from the truth. Yeah. We should not back away from the truth. No, no. And, and, and you can tell the, how powerful the truth is by the amount of controversies against the truth. 
What he's saying is that those people who actually care about the real gospel, who care about sound doctrine, who have a love for good theology, you know, who rightly divide the word of truth and warn people about the appeal to fallen human desires, he is saying those kind of people, those are heretics. They're, they're heresy hunters. They're legalists. They're Pharisees. But no, the people to whom he's referring that put up these signposts, these warnings about the appeal to health and wealth, are actually the remnant of God's faithful people who care about sound doctrine and who want to teach people the truth. Friends have frank and open conversations with each other. I've done that with the Lord. I've had the Lord say, uh, Jesse, I've had God come tell me, he said, this is what I'm going to do. I've had the Lord literally say, what do you think about this? God has asked me for my opinion. God asks Jesse Duplantis for his opinion? Really? That, is that not shocking? Pray tell, Jesse, continue. Finish your thought. I said, well, Lord, since you ask, maybe I'm doing it. He said, no, we can talk frankly. What do you think? I said, well, I don't think you ought to do that. He said, why you don't think I ought to do that? I said, well, you know, I, I know you know people more than I do, but you know, Lord, if you just let me, let me do a little bit more work on this individual, I think we can get them to you. He says, okay, go ahead. Do what you have to do. And I tell you what, the Bible says, he who wins souls is wise. Yes, and he who thinks he can counsel God is a fool. God speaking. Who is this that darkens my counsel by words without knowledge? The fact that God has not struck these people dead is a testimony to how merciful our God is. These people are not Christians. Dear friends, a Christian, a born-again Christian, someone who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God cannot utter such blasphemies. Can't happen. Such a statement cannot be said from someone who knows God. Jesse Duplantis does not know the God of the Bible. I now come into a priestly anointing. Jesus is not the only begotten on. Son of God. He is not. I'm a son of he's God. He's the first fruit. You, you're the, he's the first fruit. He's the first born of many. Anointing. Jesus is not the only begotten on. Son of God. Can you believe that? Flat out denying that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. Have they read John 3.16? I mean, honestly, friends, friends, we're not talking about minor theological differences here. We're not talking about the date of the Exodus or who wrote the book of Hebrews. These issues go to the heart of Christianity. What one believes about Jesus will determine where one spends eternity. And again, please hear me, it is not enough to believe in Jesus. You've got to believe in the right Jesus. I was shocked when I found out who the biggest failure in the Bible actually is. The biggest one in the whole Bible is God. Mm. And Kenneth Copeland goes on to explain that God is a failure because he lost uh, his most anointed angel. And when Adam and Eve fell, he says he lost the earth. So God was a failure. Of course, that is blasphemy. That is blasphemy. When Adam and Eve sinned, that is not something that caught God off guard. The Bible says that the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. It's blasphemy to teach that God is any kind of a failure. These people are not Christians. They are not Christians. They do not know the God of the Bible. You cannot be indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God and teach such blasphemies over and over and over. It cannot happen. I'm going to say to you right now, you are God's, little g. You are God's because you came from God, and you are God's. You're not just human. The only human part about you is this physical body that you live in. The real me is just like God. Wasn't the desire to be just like God kind of what led to the whole fall thing to begin with? 
And who else in the Bible wanted to be just like God? Satan did. Lucifer. The little God's doctrine is quite literally a doctrine of demons. And the prosperity preachers preach it as truth. And dear ones, as I said this morning, discernment does not begin and end with the prosperity preachers. I want to show you a clip from Rick Warren. Yeah, well, well, if, you got, if you got two doors, right. one says this one goes to life with eternity with God. Right. And this one says eternity without God. Right. If I walk out the door that says eternity without God, do I blame God for that? No. That's right. my choice. Right. That's my choice. And so I choose to, re to, to go to hell. Mm -hmm. You have to do almost the impossible. What you have to do, you have to reject the grace of but, Jesus but Christ. Doesn't... Did you catch that? Rick Warren said, to go to hell, you've got to do almost the impossible. So Rick Warren says it is almost impossible to go to hell. That is a shockingly unbiblical statement. Dear friends, it is not almost impossible to go to hell. Everybody on earth is running to hell just as fast as their little fallen feet will carry them because that is what they want. That, they want the desires of their fallen human flesh and everybody is going to hell. And God in His mercy offers an escape. Scripture says that the, the gate is wide. The, the, the way is broad that leads to destruction. But the gate that leads to life is small. And the way that leads to life narrow. And few there be who find it. Rick Warren, in his presentation of the Gospel, it's like, he says it's almost impossible to go to hell. No. Jesus said something very different when he was talking to the man whom we call the rich young ruler, the disciples were even more astonished at what Jesus said. And they said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus says, with men it is impossible, but not with God. Rick Warren says it's almost impossible to go to hell. Jesus Christ says it is almost impossible to go to heaven. And apart from God, it is impossible. With man, it is impossible. Dear friends, let, it, let us not diminish sin. Let us present the right gospel. He said, no one else wanted you. But I need you, boy. I need you, Jesse. God needs you saved. He needs you filled with the Holy Ghost. He needs you well, and he needs you strong, and he needs you rich. Dear friends, God loves us, but make no mistake about it. God does not need us. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the wonderful counselor, almighty God, Prince of Peace. He spoke the universe into existence. He knows all of the stars by name. He has need of no one and no thing. God loves us, but he does not need us. We need Him. And any man who's preaching a gospel that says that God needs us is preaching a different gospel. Preaching a different gospel. And a different gospel does not save. There is no prosperity gospel, dear friends. There is no social gospel. If you have to add an adjective to the gospel, you've got a different gospel. There's no prosperity gospel. There's no social gospel. There is just the gospel. The gospel. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. I want to close with the gospel. I want to ask you, do you know the one who gives his grace sufficient, his strength made perfect in weakness, do you know the one who has made provision for your sins? Has there ever been a time in your life when you have been convicted by God's Holy Spirit, 
through His Word that you are a sinner, that you have broken the laws of God. Thou shalt not lie. Every single one of us has told lies, many of them. Thou shalt not steal. If you have ever taken anything that does not belong to you, the value of the item is irrelevant. If you've done that, you're a thief. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Don't let yourself off the hook too quickly on that one. Jesus says if you look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery already in your heart. Have you ever looked at another person with lust? You're an adulterer. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. If you have ever used God's name in an irreverent way, that's blasphemy. If you've ever called yourself a Christian and yet behaved in such a way that brings dishonor to God, that's blasphemy. Friends, go through the commandments. I dare say that each and every one of us in here we have broken every single one of them. Oh, Justin, I've never, I've never murdered anybody. Have you not? Scripture says if you hate someone, you've committed murder in your heart. Friends, all of us have broken the laws of God. All of us. And just like when we break laws here on this earth, there is a penalty to be paid. How much more so when we break the laws of the eternal God. But when we break the laws of the eternal God, the punishment for that transgression, for that sin, is also eternal. And friends, if we die in our sins, we will go to a very real, unspeakably horrific place called hell. And we will be there for all of eternity. There is no such thing as purgatory. There are no second chances. If you die in your sins, you will rightly and justly go to hell. And the wrath of God will be poured out on you for all of eternity. And it will never end. And some say, well, that just seems so harsh. Dear friends, when a person dies and goes to hell, that person in hell hates God more in hell than he ever did on earth. He is constantly blaspheming God. And so God's wrath is constantly poured out. The punishment never catches up to the sin. The person is continually sinning. And so God's wrath is continually being poured out. And friends, let's not soft-pedal hell. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard a preacher describe hell. Uh, if you die in, without Christ, if you die outside of Christ and you go to hell, yeah, that you'll be eternally separated from God. Tell that to an atheist and see, see how much that frightens him. Tell that to a Buddhist. Eternally separated from God? So what? Don't believe in God anyway. Let's not soft pedal hell. Dear friends, do you know what the worst thing about hell is? God. When a person dies and goes to hell, he's not separated from God. He's separated from God relationally not positionally, not judiciously. Read Revelation chapter 14. Those who die and go to the lake of fire, the place in torment, they are tormented in the presence of the Lamb and the holy angels. In the presence of the Lamb. Let's not soft pedal hell. That's what makes the cross so beautiful. If we die in sins, we will rightly and justly go there. But there is good news. God has made a way of escape. He has made a way for us to escape His righteous wrath. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth. And Jesus lived as the God-man. And He lived a perfect life. The Lamb without blemish. He was perfect, spotless. 
And Jesus willingly laid down his life on the cross. And he bore the wrath of God so that you and I would not have to. He fully drank in the righteous wrath of God so that we would not have to. And on the third day, he was bodily raised from the dead and he proved himself to be who he said he was, God in human flesh. And he gained victory over sin, over the grave, over hell itself. And the only way to know that when we die, we will escape the wrath of God and we will go to heaven is for us to repent of sins, turn from our sins, and place our trust in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot earn our way to heaven. Our works are as filthy rags before a holy God. Isaiah chapter 64. Filthy rags, a very gross description in the Hebrew language. God is not impressed with our good works. He spoke the universe into existence. He's not impressed when we help a little old lady across the street. We cannot earn our salvation. We cannot work our way into heaven. Salvation is a gift. It is a gift that must be received by faith in turning from sins, repenting of sins. And so examine yourself. See if you're in the faith. If you are living in habitual, unrepentant sin, whatever that may be, whether it be lying, whether it be dishonesty, whether it be pornography, whether it be sexual immorality, whatever it is, if you are living in habitual, unrepentant sin, you need to take a look at yourself and you need to examine yourself because, dear friends, the Bible gives no room for that. Cry out to God. Cry out to God and beg Him to give you repentance, genuine repentance. It's not just a guilty conscience. Everybody has that. It's not just intellectual assent. Yes, I'm a sinner. That is important, but that's not the totality of it. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. There are two kinds of sorrow. There's a worldly sorrow that leads to death. That's a guilty conscience that everybody has. But there is a godly sorrow that leads to genuine repentance. Genuine salvation. And that is something that only God can give. If you're not certain of where you are with Christ, if maybe you're watching these DVDs, cry out to God. Throw yourself at His mercy. Ask Him to grant you genuine repentance.